Imam Malik is born in the same century of the Prophet وسلم, that shows that he is closer to the Prophet وسلم, and many of the other scholars that came later. But not only that, Imam Malik, he was unique in the sense that he had a very high place within the Khilafa, within the government at that time. That the people who were the, uh, the Amir al-Mu'mineen and the people of power at that time, they used to give Imam Malik a lot of respect. And that itself came from another reason, another factor. It was that Imam Malik, the way that he would respect and uphold the Sunnah of the Prophet was immense. Imam Malik, as we mentioned in the previous class, he would not mention a hadith of the Prophet except that he would make wudu put on his best clothes and sit in front of the people for every time he mentioned a hadith. And if people stopped him on the road and they said, they asked him about the hadith, he would say to them, this is not the place. If you want to hear a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, it needs to be in his proper place in the masjid, uh, getting prepared for hearing the hadith of the Prophet and this knowledge and this um, the fact that he showed so much so much respect to the Sunnah of the Prophet it only elevated him in status. The people saw how much he loved the Prophet not only in speech, because everyone says that they love the Prophet but once the Prophet ﷺ says something that goes against what you want, it becomes difficult. Right? Everything that the Prophet ﷺ says that is easy for you to accept, then you say, Alhamdulillah, yes, I follow the Prophet ﷺ. But the moment the Prophet ﷺ, a hadith reaches you that goes against what you are inclined towards, that is what shows the true love. Which one do you choose? Do you choose your own love, or do you choose the Prophet So Imam Malik, there is a legendary saying, statement, that is repeated by many scholars after him. And he used to say, Imam Malik, He's one of the first scholars that said this statement. Teaching his students and the future generations, he would say, pointing at the grave of the Prophet he used to say, every person's statement, no matter who you are in this world, every single person's statement, it is either accepted or rejected. It is up for scrutiny. You can look into it. Do I accept it or not? And he said, except for the person who is in this grave, the companion of this grave, meaning the Prophet ﷺ. Because when it comes to the Prophet ﷺ, as a Muslim, you don't have that choice. The choice that you have is to say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا we hear and we obey. And that itself, it comes from the belief that the Prophet ﷺ is speaking, is conveying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself promises, promises us in the Quran that if the Prophet ﷺ said anything that goes against the revelation, what He has been commanded to say, that we would have grabbed him by his right hand and we would have severed his jugular vein. 
meaning the Prophet sallallahu had been ended there and then. But the Prophet sallallahu he follows the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this statement here, it's very important to understand because throughout the ages, the religion of Islam has been made muddy by people through their cultural practices, through their own statements concerning the religion without the knowledge. You see a lot of people today, they don't follow the sunnah of the Prophet What they follow is their Imam, their peer, their Shaykh, the one that they have given the bayah to. And even if a hadith reaches them, that the Prophet said this, and the scholars are in agreement, then they follow the statements of their shaykh or the person in power in their village, in their city. And this kind of blind following is what has created a lot of the problems that we see today. It has made the lines between culture and religion very blurred. People don't understand which is which. Even certain statements where people they say, I am Shafi'i, I am Maliki, I am Hanbali, and so on and so forth. In essence, those statements, there's nothing wrong with it. You can be, follow a madhab in terms of fiqh. And you can even follow a madhab in terms of the, uh, the aqidah, because all of these four adhimma, they have the aqidah of the pious people before us. However, the problem becomes once you uh, forget that these Imams are roads that lead to the Prophet and you think that they are the, the goal, the destination themselves. And this adherence to the Sunnah of the Prophet is not something that is special about Imam Malik himself. You find it throughout the uh, scholars, the true scholars who follow the Sunnah. Even the companions themselves, there's a well known story about Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn Khattab. One day he was sitting with his son. One day he was sitting with his son. And he shared with his son a hadith of the Prophet. And he told his son, the Prophet said, that no person, no man is allowed to prevent women from coming to the masjid. No man, no person is allowed to prevent women from coming to the house of Allah. And his son replied, he said, By Allah, we will prevent them. We will not allow them to come to the masjid. Why? He said, because they use that as an excuse to mingle with people. They use that hadith as an excuse. They say, I'm going to the masjid, but instead of spending time worshipping in the masjid, they use that and they just waste their time inside the masjid. So he said, by Allah, we will prevent them, we will stop them. And here, Abdullah ibn Umar, he stopped. And he looked at his son. And he said, I tell you, that the Prophet said no one should stop and you are telling me that by Allah we will stop these women. Even though his son, he didn't mean it as opposing the Prophet he was using his own reason and he gave the explanation why he was saying it. But to Abdullah ibn Umar that was unacceptable. And he said, the Prophet says, and you say the opposite of what the Prophet is saying. And he stopped speaking to his son for a period of time. That was it. 
that one statement made Abdullah bin Umar stand with the Prophet until his son rectified his behavior and the way that he spoke. And this is a great lesson for us today. You see people, when it comes to the hadith of the Prophet they reject hadith left, right, and center, as if they're scholars, as if they're Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. There's nothing wrong with debating concerning the authenticity of a hadith, if you have the knowledge. As Muslims, we're not ex expected to accept all of the hadith that come to us. No one is saying, or no one has ever said that every single hadith of the Prophet wasallam, or what people claim to be hadith is authentic. But you need the knowledge, you need the insight. It's not something where you sit on a chair and you pick and choose and you say, you know what, I don't like this hadith or it doesn't sound right to me. It's a science, it's a field. People have spent their whole lives. So when it comes to the love of the Prophet وسلم, this was one thing that really uh, made Imam Mali stand out from the rest of the scholars. And in turn, it was one thing that elevated him in rank. It elevated him in rank. He had the privilege of living in Medina, taking directly from uh, the uh, the Tabi'een at that time, those who had studied directly underneath uh, the major companions of the Prophet وسلم, and that knowledge was directly uh, passed on to Imam Malik. Uh, Imam Malik was a person with great patience and he gave knowledge uh, the respect it deserved. In last week's class, we spoke about how the uh, Amir at that time, he wanted his children to be taught. And he sent for Imam Malik. And Imam Malik didn't come. And some time passed, and the Amir summoned Imam Malik by force. And he said, I requested you to teach my children, but you didn't come. And he told Imam, Imam Malik, told the Amir, he said, Ya Amir al muminin knowledge is sought out. Knowledge doesn't come to you. If you want knowledge, it's not something where you can tell an alim, a scholar, a sheikh, an imam, come to my house and teach me. You have to seek out that scholar. And there's a story of one of the many teachers of Imam Mali, um, Nafir. Nafir was a great scholar in his own right. And he got a lot of the knowledge from Ibn Umar uh, himself. However, Nafir he had a very difficult personality. This is well documented in history that he was very strict, very stern. And many people, they were often put off by the way that he was. But Imam Malik was not. Imam Malik found a workaround where many people left Nafi' because of his harshness. Imam Malik, he said, what I used to do was I used to go, and when I found Nafir, I would ask him one or two questions. And then I would leave him alone. Because I noticed that once you ask too many questions, then that is when things get difficult. So he said, I found a solution, a workaround. So Imam Mali, he went through the harshness, the difficulty of seeking knowledge one question or two questions at a time. So knowledge became very dear to him. He understood the value of knowledge. And this is true for every single thing in life. If you work hard a whole day 
and you get a hundred dollars and you you sweat it for those hundred dollars that hundred dollars is not just going to go like that you're going to think twice do I really need this? is it really worth a hundred dollars? but if someone comes to you or you're walking down the street and someone you know, hands you or you find a hundred dollars then you're going to blow that hundred dollars in a matter of minutes you go into the first shop this was money that I didn't count on right? so you're going to use it in whatever way you want so because knowledge is something that does not come easy it does not come with comfort it does not come with ease to gain it you have to stay up at night in the same way that you are right now you have to seek it out. You come to the massage, you sit with the people who have studied, and you gain that knowledge. And you have that patience and that consistency. And all that takes time, effort, and sometimes money. Alhamdulillah, we're blessed in the sense that a lot of the knowledge that we have available to us today, it doesn't cost much, if anything at all. But that's not how it used to be back in the day. That you had to travel significantly, significant travels. And you had to come prepared, and you had to, and you had to. But today, a person and everyone has a smartphone in their pocket. If you want to Google something, you will check it. And you see, is this true? Or many of the massage today, alhamdulillah, they have an imam at least someone in the community that has studied you find something online you can go and discuss it with someone and say i read this is this really true but imagine back in the day where there was no one that had that knowledge there's no internet there was no scholar in the city what you had to do was if you wanted to gain that knowledge you had to travel yourself you, you might memorize quran in your city from your elders, from your parents, and that's it. If you want to learn Arabic, you have to travel. If you want to learn Hadith, you have to travel. If you want to learn Fiqh, you have to travel. So, Imam Malik, Rahimullah, his story is uh, an amazing story. What makes it even more amazing is this encounter with Imam Shafi'i Taala, and Imam Shafi'i actually studied underneath Imam Malik for some time and this encounter between two of the greatest uh, uh, imma or imams of the uh, uh, in Muslim history um, it is in a very beautiful way the fact that Imam Shafi'i he sat with him he was a young boy when he came to Imam Malik and he came to Medina. And Imam Malik, he got upset because he saw this young boy day after day sitting in his gathering without any books, without any pens, not writing down a single, single hadith. And he thought he was a joker. He thought he was just someone that was sitting there. And he confronted Imam Shafi one day. He said, I see you sitting in this, these classes without a book, without a pen. Are you wasting your time? And Imam Shafi'i, he was very honest and he said, I come from a poor family. We don't have the means. But Allah blessed me with something better that I am able to memorize. And when Imam Malik heard that, he was shocked and he was amazed. And Imam Shafi'i said, I have memorized every single hadith that you mentioned from the very beginning, the first time I came. Not only that, he said, I have memorized the book, the Muwaqqa of Imam Malik, the one that he wrote, a hadith, the collection of a hadith. And Imam Malik asked him, he tested him. And once he saw the potential of Imam Shafi'i, he said those famous words 
he said, Oh young man, I see in your face light. I see you in your face light, no. And this no, this light is a light that can be extinguished by sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give this light to those who sin many excessively. Every person sins, but the more you sin, the more that light diminishes. So he gave that golden advice to Imam al-Shafi'i. And it's not only true from Imam al-Shafi'i, but for every single person, whether you are a scholar or not, this light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, whether it is a bright understanding, intellect, or if it is the nur of Iman, the light of Iman, it is something that we should safeguard. On a final point, like I said in, after the Salah, this Iman that we have is not something that we should take for granted. We, most of us are born into Muslim families. Many of us didn't have to struggle for our faith. We didn't have to make many sacrifices. We were taught by our mothers, our fathers. And that is a blessing in itself. But Iman, it needs work. The Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, we say, Iman increases and it decreases. It increases with good deeds and it decreases with bad deeds. So you need to constantly be worried about your Iman, about the Iman of your family, people around you. It's very sad today, and this is sort of a, on a tangent, that some people, they only worry about themselves. They see their wife struggling. They see their children struggling with their iman, committing sin after sin. And the only thing the person is concerned about is, Alhamdulillah, I go to the masjid. They might have a brother, they might have a sister. They might have a cousin, they might have a friend. And those people are very, very far away from the religion. Yet that never crosses their minds. They think, Alhamdulillah, I come to the masjid, I help, and that is it. But we need to think bigger. We need to think more about others than we only think about ourselves. And sometimes it can get overwhelming and it can get too much. We are not responsible for other people, but we have a responsibility. That is the difference. No soul bears the burden of another soul, but yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you, what did you do? Did you convey the message? When you saw harm happening in your own house, did you speak up? Did you at least advise? So, when we look at the lives of these great Imams, it's not just history where we say he was born then and he died then and he traveled here and he gained this knowledge. We're trying to look into their lives for practical benefits. It's easy to get starstruck. We look at these great Imams, the knowledge that they reach, and how far ago they lived, and you think to yourself, these are amazing people, I can never be like them. But then you lose out on the benefit itself. The benefit is that you try, and you keep trying. You aim for these scholars, you aim for the one that these scholars are aiming for, for the Prophet and inshallah, you will not be far off. Inshallah, with that we will conclude.